Hi everybody, I'm BJ. I'm the genealogy specialist at Maine State Library. And tonight I'm gonna to talk about the non-population schedules from the US Federal Census. And I know I say this like every third program, but I love these as a data set. They have absolutely wonderful information. If sometimes about your direct ancestors and if not, at least about the world they lived in, in the second half of the 19th century. So let's start by sharing my screen. And stopping my video so you don't have to look at me staring at my screen. So do you all have uh, ancestry on your screen? Yes, okay. So we're going to go to census and search, census and voter lists. And then we're gonna select the US federal census collection. Now, one of the reasons a lot of people don't deal with what I'm gonna talk about tonight is they come up after other census results and after the name variations and all of that. So on a lot of searches, unless you've waded through to page 17, of your results, you're not going to get these. Okay, so we're gonna to go to the US Federal Census Collection. We're gonna scroll down and we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk briefly about the slave schedules. And then this is what we're going to be looking at is these bottom ones here. So let's look at the slave schedules first. They're some of the earliest and so let's go into 18, these were done in 1850 and 1860, mostly in the Southern states. Um, you will see that, that for some reason they did it in New Jersey. There were slaves in New Jersey, um, but let's go to South Carolina and we'll choose a county. I have no idea where these counties are. I'm a Northerner. So we're gonna to go to Lower All Saints Township. And this looks like it was a big plantation because you have the owner's name and then you have a number of the slave, so one of each of these, the age, the sex, and the color. And the color was either B for black or M for mixed or mulatto. Anyone notice what's not here? Names. names. Right. No names. So these are not necessarily the most helpful records for people looking for African American or mixed ancestors. Um, this does tell you, I mean, this, this man must have had a really large plantation because look at the number of, he's got at least 84 slaves. So let's go back and let's choose another state where, as far as I know, the you didn't get all of those big, here you'll see you've got much smaller numbers. And this was much more common, especially when you got away from the big plantations in the coastal areas. Um, but that's what you get. Um, this is one of the things I'll talk about on Thursday when I talk about African-American genealogy because this this is a really hard thing to get beyond with no names but that's what the slave schedules cover as i said they didn't do them for um for northern states for the most part um so you're not going to, even though there were some slaves even up till 1850 in some Northern states, you don't get them 
as this separate schedule. Okay, and yeah, Mary, you, you can often through the name of the owner and looking at probate and estate records, and that's what you end up doing. So let's go back and let's take a look at some of these others. The, the, um, the slave schedule for 1860 is very similar. The 1890 veteran schedule um, was supposed to only track union veterans, but some census enumerators did indeed track Confederate veterans. So let's look at Maine and Kennebec, and we'll go here for Augusta. And this is the one part of the 1890 census that does survive. Um, and as you can see here, they ask for the name of the, the surviving military member or the widow's name if the surviving, if, if it's, he isn't surviving, gives the rank the company, which is going to generally be a main, you know, Civil War military was still pretty much state-based. Um, the regiment or vessel, depending on, you know, so you have infantry, um, date they enlisted, date of discharge, and how long they served. And then what they do down here is if you have person number one up there, Person, so someone just Augusta is the post office address. So number three, who is Lewis Selbing, it looks like, or Selbing Lewis, I guess it's Lewis Selbing, had his left arm amputated. Um, gunshot in leg and hand. So they're looking for the disabilities for pensions at this point. You get one here who re-enlisted in the field. So number seven, I'm presuming, yeah, has one of the longer lengths of service. Um, so if you have ancestors who fought in the Civil War, it's worth taking a look and seeing if they're listed here in the veteran census or if they'd already died, if their widow was listed. Um, and again, this can be helpful when you, because Maine didn't start doing death records until two years after this, you may be able to at least, you know, figure out, well, you know, he died after, you know, before 1890 if the widow is listed. And if you're not sure on somebody, if you, you know, you may be able to co correlate this with other later records and then work back from this to the military record if somebody, if there are multiple men with the same name by looking where they lived later in life or their wife's name if it's a widow. Does that make sense how you would use this? So let's take a look. The next one on the list. Um, let's actually start with the mortality schedules. Having mentioned that Maine did not keep vital records until 1892 for the most part. From 1850 to 1880 and in some states for 1885 because they did a, a federally subsidized state census. They looked at who died in the year before the census. For example, with 1880, they're looking at who died basically from June 1879 through the end of May 1880. And again, we'll go to Maine and Kennebec. And here we have 
the people who died in the year ending May 31st, 1880 in the town of Albion. And so you have an infant and it gives the age where the person was born, where their parents were born, occupation if relevant, um, the month in which they died, the cause of death, and I'm trying to remember which, this is how long they'd been a resident of the, the county that they died in. Um, so again, it's going to tell you various bits. Um, and so here you have one where he acquired the disease when he lived in Bangor. Um, and you get information here about where parents were from. You know, these were done as an early public health issue. And so some of these will be, um, They're, look, they're looking at why people died. Um, and some of them will have more information than early death records and definitely more information than if for some of these people in these years, the only death record you can find is a newspaper notice. This will have more information than that newspaper notice. And you know, we can go and look here. They give you the instructions. So you can look and see what, you know, in a case of any unusual number of deaths by violence or accident, as by the caving of a mine or similar, similar calamity, an explanation should be given in the space for remarks. So, you know, if, if you've got somebody who, you know, was a coal miner or disappeared on a ship, it may well tell you that. Um, so, you can read the um, the instructions to the enumerators, and here we have Augusta, you know, much longer list than Albion, um, and you know, a lot of tuberculosis. You'll look and see, you know, the first three. There's another couple. Um, lots of children dying um, in ways that no longer happen. So, um, so these are only catching one year out of 10 from 1850 to 1880. And they also didn't necessarily catch every death. You know, if somebody died and the doctor didn't remember it, you know, they were pretty good at taking records, but you also got people who didn't get medical attention or whatever, who didn't get listed. But at least it's something to look for if you're looking for death records in a state that doesn't have them before 1890 to see if anyone in your, and again, it may be a sibling that has information about where the parents were from that you didn't have. So that's the mortality schedules. And those were done for Maine from 1850 to 1880. So four censuses worth. Um, let's take a look at the defective, dependent, and delinquent classes. This was done one year in 1880. And let's take a look at what they looked for. So we'll go to Maine. And let's choose a different county this time. So here we are in Oxford County. Um, let's choose randomly. So here's the town of Norway. So here in this first list, we have the people who are in an insane asylum. And there's a lot of politically not correct language in this. I'm gonna warn you right now, okay? I'm not going to um, tone it down because I'm just gonna talk about what's written here. 
So you have on this first line, Simon Merrill from the town of Norway, form of disease, raving. Occasional attacks, started at the age of 15. He's often kept in a cell, but doesn't need a straight jacket. And he's in the asylum in Augusta. And so he, he's technically, you know, his family's in Norway, but he's here in Augusta in the insane asylum. So this gives you information. Um, and if somebody was discharged, they tell you. Um, I will also tell you, notice, oh, that's not, epilepsy is often, this one's crossed out, but you often will see people with epilepsy or epileptic fits in the insane asylum. So the next thing they looked at, and you know, talk about politically incorrect language, were the people who were known as idiots. You know, what we would today probably just call intellectually challenged. And so they, they have the name, where they're from, is the person self-supporting or partly so, um, the age at which the idiocy occurred, and B is for birth. Cause, um, size of head, large, small, or natural. Um, and then, you know, has the person been at a training school? So that's an interesting, and again, you, it's not unusual to get people who are epileptic in this category. So on the next page, we get those who were deaf mutes. Um, whether someone's able to be self-supporting, cause of death or deafness, and this is somebody who's in an asylum or was for a while. Um, and then you have people who are blind. And again, you get name, town, self-supporting and the choices are yes, no, and partly if they know. Um, so John Hobbs became blind from blasting rocks. This came on gradually. Here's one for firecrackers. Um, here's someone from the Mexican War. Then on this page, we have homeless children. Um, and then nobody from the town was in prison at the time of the census, because they also list this. Um, and again, you get what the alleged offense was. Let's see if I can find another page that has somebody. And so here we have Charles Goodwin. He's in the Paris jail for theft, not at hard labor. So, and they're saying there is no jail or prison in this district, um, but you do have this one person who was in prison. But they're saying this is a duplicate from somewhere else, so. Um, so that is the defective dependent. Oh, and then the last one is people in the town, the town farm or poorhouse. 
and you get those and you know why they're there and you know, this one has a pension but he has an illness he's got this one has spinal trouble um and date of admission so you can tell how long somebody was there so as i said it, it's gives you some idea of what the town was like you know or how they were dealing with people who didn't fit in um and so it says that robert mclucas was um getting a pension of 26 dollars per year for services in the war of 1812 and this is in 1880 so he was a ripe old age when he died so um so that's the, this and as i said this only was done as a separate one in 1880 then we went through the mortality schedules there is a, a special census done around 1890 um for people who were deaf and you have to look by by name so let's okay. just yeah could uh i kind of a distant cousin who was deaf at that period of time, Albert Lincoln Carlisle. I don't know. Here in you... Maine? Yes. Let's, okay, so let's try Carlisle. Carlisle. Yeah, Albert L. That's him. That's him. So let's take a look. He became quite important in the deaf community back in that time. And so it looks like he was married to Clara Gray. That's correct. And have a date of marriage, place of marriage. Were they related before marriage? No. Number of children born, who was hearing. Um, hmm. Frank Clayton born April 11th, 1889. And then it looks like there's a daughter, Ethel, who came along in 1892. So, you know, again, this gives you information that, you know, Woodstock, Maine may, may not have recorded this marriage. Mm -hmm. And it may give you a date that you wouldn't otherwise have. I don't think I have it. So there it is, October 26 in Woodstock. Yeah. Maybe seven or one. It, I think it's 1887 which makes sense because then you get a kid in 1889 and one in 1892. That's true. So that, um, so yeah, can you see how, again, with Maine not, this is just before Maine started doing the, um, or it's right around the time Maine started doing vital records, but you may get records from people, you know, if somebody had, older children, they may not have records, but you could maybe see them here. So, and then the Indian census rolls are just what they sound like. Um, they were attempts, these are mostly Western. There's not really much east of the Mississippi. There's a little, the Carlisle School was east. Um, but as, if, if you look here, you know, it's, it's Navajo and Great Lakes, Green Bay, if I remember correctly, there's no, none of the main ones are here. Um, but if we look at, let's look at Pine Ridge in 1900, This one's typed and they give you both the Native American name and the English name. Um, the head of the household 
the relationship, the age. Some of them give you more, but this is, this is pretty typical. Um, and so let's do one more just so you can see the range. Actually, I want one of the ones that's earlier. I think this may be, there we go. And again, here you have both names, if you can, the relationships and an age, which, as I said, is pretty typical of what you get on these. There are some of them that are handwritten that are really hard to read. I don't know why. Um, but one of the things uh, one of the things I've got planned in the next round of these is looking at some of the um, Native American records because people have asked me about it. And again, it's interesting to get. Um, here's they also did the, the um, 1880. And then these are photographs from Indian territory in the 19th century. So there's some really interesting stuff there. Um, so let's look at these. These are the really, so these are the other non-population, these are the real non-population schedules. Um, and what you're gonna see is we've got agriculture, Let's choose Maine. I'm gonna start with the social statistics because that's, um, it was done for three censuses. Let's do this. And what this is looking at is what the community was like. So here's the city of Auburn. And they've got the real estate valuation. There's a library, a court library, and um, a school library, and a subscription library. You get um, what the taxation was, how much they took in. You get the number of people supported through the year. And so here native does not mean Native American. It means US born versus foreign born. And then um, how many people were living at the town farm on a particular date. Um, and so you get criminals convicted during the year number in prison. Up here you get, there are two high school, no sorry, there's, two male and one female teacher at the high school and other information, there, this is not the best one but information about the schools. So there is a high school in Auburn at this point. There are many towns in Maine that did not have a high school. And then this is the really helpful one. List of the churches in town. And how many people the church will hold. So the, the Baptist church is 800 people and the Methodist church holds 200. Um, and I, they did this here, it's supposed to be newspapers and periodicals, um, but they have other stuff there. So if you're struggling, um, you like here, let's go one, another one. So we get somebody who's, so this is the town of Green, 
which is just out, it's between Auburn and Augusta. And you can see there's no public library, there's no court library. Um, the average wage for a farmhand who gets board, room and board is um, $15. A day laborer gets a dollar a day. Um, unless they're provided with meals, in which case they get 50 cents. Carpenter gets $2. So there's a significant premium here for skill over, you know, the carpenter makes twice as much as the day laborer. Um, there's only one school in town, no high school, no newspaper, and two churches. One is labeled Baptist and one is free will Baptist. So, um, so that's the special statistics or the social statistics, which can be really helpful, as I said, for figuring out, you know, if there was no high school in town, it may explain why your ancestor didn't go to high school. Um, if you're looking to see where the records are for a church, it helps to see what churches were in town. Um, and so on. Um, you know, gives you an idea of the wages that somebody would have made. So let's go back to here and let's start with the industrial because it's going to actually take in fewer people. So we're going to do industry and we're going to do 1870 and we're going to choose, let's choose Androscoggin because then we can go to Lewiston that we know was heavily industrial. If any of you have been through Lewiston, you've probably seen the mill buildings along the river. And so what this does is anyone whose business generated more than $500 of business for the year, you have the name of the company or the person, what type of thing they did. So here's a tin, iron, and copper smith. Here's someone who makes shirts and collars. Um, and so you know, they have tinsmith's tools, they average employing three people, they made $1,550 a year. Um, the materials they use, they've got four tons of iron, a hundred boxes of tin, the value of those, and then what, then they produced tinware and job work, you know, so probably with the iron. Whereas down here you have someone using cotton cloth and linen and thread, and they made 700 shirts, 25 collars, 100 gaiters, and who knows? So here's someone using silk for making hats. So you know, if your ancestor had his or her own business is here. See, this is the Mrs. Lowry doing millinery. Hi, hi, they, they employed three people. They made $780 on their business, or that's what they value it at. Um, or sorry, that's the total wages. And they had $200 of materials and produced 400, four, sorry, 2,000 and produced $4,000 of goods. So it's worth looking to see if your ancestor shows up here. You can search these by name. So for example, if we put in Lowry and Lewiston, Maine, there they come up. So you can search these by name. 
or you know if you have several ancestors in an area in a small town it may be worth looking to see what was being produced in the town um, and then finally we have the agricultural and we're going to choose eight let's choose 1880 and let's choose what's a nice rural county well cumberland's going to have farms and we'll choose bridgeton and this can be hard to read i'm warning you right now um but it's worth it to get an idea of what um so here we have in bridgeton um a rufus gibbs he's the owner rather than a renter he's got 20 acres tilled 10 in permanent meadows or pasture 400 as woodland and forest and other unimproved so he's got a fair bit of land for somebody in maine at that point but a lot of it is just woodland and forest. Um, he values his farm land and buildings at $4,500, machinery at 100, livestock at 25. He spent $10 on repairing stuff. Um, he hired labor for seven weeks. Um, and then you look and see he's got moan not moan he's got hay he's got one horse no mule and then we go down here and i chose the first one because it's the easiest and you can go through and he's got one milk cow um not much else for livestock but you've got swine and poultry and sheep whether they made any cheese from the milk and then down here they you know buckwheat and corn and oats and um fiber including hemp um, which was not controversial at the time um maple oops i didn't want to do that and then in the bottom you get things like potatoes and they distinguish between Irish potatoes and sweet potatoes which I thought was interesting orchards they have apples and peaches nurseries vineyards and forest products so it can give you a really good idea what your ancestor was growing and how prosperous they were compared to their neighbors you know, were they doing well or were they, you know, struggling? Like here you've got this Daniel Miller has, I think that's an $800 assessment on, looks like it's maybe about 35 acres as opposed to people who have several hundred acres and a $3,000 a lot or um, claim of value. So you know, it's a way to see what they're growing. Are they specializing or are they just doing subsistence farming with a little bit of everything? Um, you hear this Daniel Miller spent $1 on building and repairing on his farm in the year before the census whereas someone else spent $600. And is it just that he, you know, is it a difference in income? Or sorry, no, he spent 25, 600 is a different column. Take that back. You know, were they able to hire a lot of labor or none? So that, that's the non-population schedules. So you have issues around health. You have um, the social statistics. Um, 
you get manufacturing and then you get um, the, the slave schedules and the Indian schedules. So it's a lot to take in. I know that. The best thing you can do is go play with them. And I will remind you, you, you go to Ancestry, search the census and voter lists, and then the federal census collection, and then scroll down the page. And that's where you'll find them at the bottom. But it's an interesting thing because you know, up until 18, the 1840 census, you only have the head of the household. And they did a little of this like by town, but not by individual in 1810, 1820, 1830. And then suddenly the difference between 1840 and 1850, where they, the census asks for everybody's name and age, except for the slaves where they just asked for age. And um, these more in-depth manufacturing or industri industrial details and the agricultural details and the social statistics. Um, it's a real change over the, the 19th century in how much information they're collecting. Um, and you know, we've seen it in other records with the regular population schedules, with passenger lists, with naturalizations. You know, We've seen it, as I said, with several different categories of, you know, it's the same time where you go from only a couple states in 1850 requiring recording births, marriages, and deaths to almost half in 1900, or at least half in 1900. So, you know, so a lot of these, like the, um, were done as looking at, um, like the mortality schedules were an early public health measure um, because they were trying to figure out how to keep people from dying <laughs> before antibiotics and all of that. So any questions? Well, Wayne, I'm glad we found something for you. <laughs> I was just going to say, this is stuff that I had never looked at, never even known about. So this was very helpful for me. Yeah. You know, in general, you're only, you're not going to, you know, if you can't find an ancestor on the census for one of these years, they're probably not going to show up in this either. And a lot of people won't. So, you know, because like with the industrial, they were looking for people who had made $500 the previous year. And so, you know, if somebody had only made 450 with their manufacturing, they're not going to be there. But it can give you some idea of, you know, is it a town where everybody is doing lots and lots of big farms with a lot of hay and hiring people like you see out in the Midwest? Or is it smaller farms here in Maine? where you know, people are basically providing for their own needs and not, you know, particularly by 1880, you start getting grain shipped by railroads to the Great Lakes and you get places like Buffalo and Cleveland with huge grain elevators from that um, trade. And that's a very different style of farming than you would see here in New England. And you can see that in these records. So, as I said, you know, I'm a, between my interest in, in the social sciences and my genealogy, I just absolutely geek out over these data sets because they really can give you a picture that you don't get from just looking at an individual family. Okay, so other questions? No questions? Okay, 
i will stop the recording.